This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. Also, make sure to check out and subscribe to our YouTube original channel, UCTV Prime, available only on YouTube. Good afternoon. My name is George Breslauer. I'm the Executive Vice Chancellor and Provost here at UC Berkeley. And uh, it's a pleasure to welcome this important conference and a pleasure to welcome all of our out-of-town visitors to Berkeley and to the Berkeley campus. Uh, <laughs> conference, as you know, is entitled Democracy Rising, Global Prospects, Perils, and Policy Challenges, which is a um, subtitle that to some extent offsets the, offsets the unadulterated optimism of the main title. So we have Democracy Rising, maybe. <laughs> But this, is, this conference is also the inaugural event in the founding of the Center for Political Development and Democracy here at Berkeley. Uh, like the new center that it now inaugurates, this conference brings together and showcases the formidable energies and talents of a portion of the Berkeley faculty and visiting scholars who are dedicated to the study of democracy and political development around the world. Many of our speakers who are not currently affiliated with Berkeley nevertheless have deep roots here. Some have served our university in their professional lives outside of academia, while others received their PhDs here and have gone on to luminous careers as intellectual leaders at other institutions. Our speakers at this conference, though, are not all of Berkeley stock. They also include distinguished figures from outside the Berkeley community. We're grateful to our guests from afar for joining us, and we very much hope that you'll leave this conference feeling yourselves to be members of the UC Berkeley intellectual community. As you'll see over the next several hours and throughout the day tomorrow, our speakers include distinguished guests from abroad, including a former chief election commissioner of India, a leading member of the newly elected Tunisian Constituent Assembly, and a leading light of contemporary Russian journalism. We extend a warm welcome to our guests panelists who have come from overseas, as well as to those who make their home in North America and join us from the likes of Washington, Houston, Williamsburg, Boston, and Los Angeles. Now this conference and the center that it inaugurates are in part the brainchild of Ambassador Jeremy Kinsman who is currently a resident international scholar at the Institute for Governmental Studies here at Berkeley, and formerly the Canadian ambassador to the Russian Federation, Canadian ambassador to the European Union, and Canadian High Commissioner to the United Kingdom. Ambassador Kinsman has been instrumental in pulling us together for this occasion, and we're grateful to him for his organizational efforts, as well as for his service as a participant in two panels at this conference. Now, diplomats are usually exceedingly well-spoken, but occasionally, very occasionally, they may leave you feeling that they didn't really have much that they felt they could say. Well, as you're about to see, Jeremy is an exception to this. He is a great diplomat, but anyone who has heard him speak knows that diplomats need not be bland. They can be as outspoken and as trenchant in their assessments as can any professional social scientist or journalist. We're also grateful to another current visiting scholar at the Institute for Governmental Studies, Alan Unger, for his superb organizational efforts, which were key to making this gathering possible. For organizational work, we're also indebted to Larry Michalak, an affiliate of our Center for Middle Eastern Studies here at Berkeley and a leading expert on Tunisia. 
Larry will speak on tomorrow morning's panel on the remarkable experience of Tunisia and on Tunisia's role as a leading force in the Arab Spring and in the political transformations that are reshaping the Middle East and North Africa. Now, I myself am a specialist on Russia and before, before that on the Soviet Union. I'm a political scientist and a comparativist. So I take special pleasure in opening an event that includes a substantial Russia component and that delves into comparison between lands of the former USSR and those of the Middle East and North America. I'll be chairing one of the Russia panels tomorrow afternoon. And as time allows for me, I look forward to, uh, to listening in on the panels and roundtables uh, today and tomorrow. Welcome again to Berkeley, and thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, and this will be the last of the inaugural speeches setting up the uh, program. My name is Pradeep Chibar. I'm the director of the Institute of International Studies, and in collaboration with the Institute of Governmental Studies, whose director Jack Citron had to step away for a moment. So I'm going to say thanks on behalf of both of us. I'd like to welcome you. This is the first in a series of collaborations between IGS and IIS, and uh, there's more coming. In fact, we're working closely together on a number of things, including political, political inequality, democratic inclusion, etc. but those are events which will happen in the coming months and years. So at IGS and IIS, we're trying to bridge this gap between the US and non-US cases as you would have in the social sciences, and we're trying to see what one can learn from each other. My job here is just to reiterate what the provost said. Thank you for coming, welcoming all of you, and I look forward to listening. But I also have one more important task, which is to thank the myriads of people who made this possible. George has done a great job thanking um, Jeremy Kinsman and Alan Unger, who's indefatigable energy actually made this possible, if that's, if I can never speak a word with that many syllables. I'd also like to thank uh, a number of other people, including Nazar El Said from the Center for Middle Eastern Studies, Jeff Pennington from uh, the Institute for Slavic, East European, and Eurasian Studies. There are, I always remember there are three E's in it. David Caron from the Miller Institute and the Law School, and the Religion, Politics, and Globalization Program, Steve Fish for many other things as well, to the staff at the Institute of Government Still Studies, particularly Catherine Nguyen for putting in all the work that made this possible. I just have one logistics announcement. At some point, during each panel, there will be a commercial break. The reason being that the videographer needs to change the videotapes every one hour. So the videographer will raise his or her hand, his hand. The speaker will be asked to stop. It will take 25 seconds. We'll play the UC Berkeley fight song. And <laughs> after that, we'll get back to the panel. So with that, Steve and Jeremy, the floor is yours. Thank you. How do you do? And thank you for coming. I, uh, I'm Jeremy Kinsman. I think this says I'm. No, it does say I'm Jeremy Kinsman. I was about to say I'd rather be Steve Fish, but there you are. Um, if I may uh, say one thing, I am. Uh, I was a career diplomat, an ambassador, and I'm now, through the generosity of uh, a Berkeley spirit, part of the family here. And I, I thought it very important to underline my very deep sorrow at the murder yesterday of Ambassador Stevens. I just wanted to say that in this place, he was probably many times in this room. You know, uh, people make fun of ambassadors and, and not without reason sometimes. But this young guy was a different kind of ambassador for your country, uh, and indeed on instruction. Uh, he was out uh, in the street, among the people, uh, connecting and, and showing uh, what a good American is. Uh, he wasn't traveling in a helicopter limousine bubble. Uh, he was doing what modern ambassadors have to do. He was practicing what we call public diplomacy. Uh, his accreditation 
by tradition was to the host country authorities, but in virtual reality, his accreditation was to the people uh, in Libya, and that is what he was trying to do. And you know, it, it's tragic, Bob Lagama uh, met him three uh, months ago and was telling me, of course, that he had had a posting in Libya, uh, uh, spoke Arabic, uh, at the beginning of the nonviolent protests in Benghazi uh, two and a half years ago or two years ago, when Benghazi became actually a, a separate enclave, when they took the city, he was positioned in, I think via a submarine, small boat. a small boat, uh, and, uh, and he was with them from the start. And uh, as the uprising proceeded, and, and you know the rest of that story, uh, he, he stayed with them and, and then became uh, the ambassador. So the cruel uh, irony of this is that, uh, is that a man who was really Libya's best friend was killed there, probably because he was. That's probably the reason. Anyway, I wanted to start by saying that and, uh, and thank you. Um, I direct a uh, support uh, for the uh, project uh, uh, in democracy support for the uh, community of democracies. We have been doing this research project, which is evidence-based, interview-based for the last five years. And I will provide you with, uh, as context, for this meeting, some of its findings. I don't think what I'm going to say is going to astonish any of you. I, I don't, uh, I think most of these things are common ground, but they do provide uh, something of a framework. First of all, the big picture. Uh, since 1973, uh, we've gone to 194 countries in the world. And uh, the number of so-called free countries have gone from 29% to 43%. Uh, the number of uh, clearly autocratic countries have declined from 42 to 29. If you put it in population terms, our population's around 7 billion. 1992, 25% of us, or 1.3 billion people, were so-called free. Today, 43%, or 3 billion. 1.7 billion is a lot of good work. Uh, the last two years, of course, have been global game changers. Uh, there's been an overall reversal of the trend line that Freedom House identified uh, in 2010. Freedom House had seen that the trend line forward had stopped and moved backward. Uh, they called it a democratic recession. For the first time, for the fourth year in a row, retreats from democracy outstripped gains. But what happened in Tunisia, in Egypt, Bahrain, maybe, Yemen, uh, probably Libya, and maybe what's happening in Syria, have given a lie to the notion that aspirations to democracy are culture-specific or region-specific. In Arab societies which have experienced uprisings, the countries I mentioned, there's much greater self-confidence. Uh, in others, however, which haven't experienced the uprisings, uh, <clears throat> there is impatience radiated by Al Jazeera, particularly among young people whose isolation is ended, but there's great caution among older citizens. I uh, Take a look at the Gallup poll released this week uh, it shows a major divide in confidence between the populations of countries which have experienced uprisings, which have changed regimes, Tunisia, Libya, Yemen, and Egypt, who have high confidence uh, with respect to the future on security and safety, on economic progress, and on good governance. In all four, over 70% believe that security and governance will improve. And on economic uh, performance, only Egypt uh, is a kind of outlier at uh, 41%. However, in the other countries where regimes have not been changed, uh, Morocco, uh, Algeria, the occupied territories, especially Jordan, optimism on all of these points is below 40%. Al 
outside, there's been positive contagion from Tahrir Square. I've been to Moscow uh, recently, and you'll hear about Russia. Uh, what happened this winter in Russia wasn't uh, because of Tahrir Square, but uh, what people in Tahrir Square were uh, claiming, uh, dignity, uh, uh, transparency, fairness, were very much the things that Russians in the streets of Moscow were claiming. You know, in Africa, there are going to be 23 multi-party elections uh, this year. Several other autocracies are under very heavy street protest right now in Gabon and Togo. Elsewhere, in other parts of the world, other autocracies, autocracies, including Burma and probably Cuba, are loosening up. Negative reactions, especially to unintended violent consequences, are also happening. Uh, there are counter-democracy trends right across the Sahel, from Mauritania to northern Nigeria. And in contrast to the way the Burmese junta uh, responded to the fates of Gaddafi and Mubarak uh, uh, and, and to violent revolts, some hardline regimes have decided to clamp down instead of loosening up. I think of Iran, Uzbekistan, China, and of course President Assad in Syria. U.S. public opinion. You know, the Arab Spring initially revived the U.S. public interest from a low of disinterest caused by the overextension of the freedom agenda in the last administration and disappointment in Iraq and Afghanistan. But the combination of uh, recession worries in this country and uh, the more or less disastrous 80% cut in foreign news coverage in electronic and print media has kind of dampened that initial positive effect. I wonder about the impact of the uh, Libyan killing of Ambassador Stevens. It's probably a negative for U.S. public opinion about democracy rising. I find that in the last two days, comment and understanding has just generalized across the area and has generalized with respect to its focus on U.S. national security. There's a tendency not to differentiate Libya. Libya was singularly unprepared for inclusive democratic governance from its neighbors. It wasn't a reason to delay it, but they simply did not have the building blocks. And it shows what extremists can do to the agenda uh, in both countries. Uh, jihadists, long suppressed by dictators, uh, are not free to operate, but they're operating uh, with many fewer uh, constraints. And as I said, a byproduct that is sad is that it could discourage discourage the emerging trend for U.S. ambassadors to be out and around the people rather than in the bubble. Our project is about understanding change and helping democracies to understand change. Let me just cover some points of conclusion uh, that we have come to. Uh, on uprisings, you know, it's, it's odd, it's interesting that from 1949 to 1973, uprisings almost always installed communist regimes, leftist regimes, China, Iran, Guatemala, Ma uh, 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 Cuba, uh, Vietnam, Cambodia. But since 1973, over 60 democratic uprisings have occurred. They're anti-authoritarian, Philippines, South Africa, Haiti, Indonesia, or plainly anti-communist from 1989 and continuing, Georgia, Kyrgyzstan, and they don't go communist. And the question is how many will go Islamist? But whatever, whatever, ever since 1973, <laughs> they've always taken policy analysts and experts by surprise, most recently in Tunisia and Egypt. Democracies have had a habit of fearing the consequences of change, uh, which contributed probably to, to, to our overcommitment historically to the status quo. There's been a tendency to equate the status quo to stability and hence to security. And we, we spent years of making false choices because of this, dictators or hostile Islamists. We deferred our values to overriding interests, the Cold War, or the war on terror. Obviously, uprisings shouldn't surprise because public opinion prepares itself over time before they happen. 
shared awareness is driven usually by perception of unfairness rather than in favor of democracy as such. Anyway, when do popular uprisings succeed? When they're bottom up. When there's a minimum income level, it's probably about $1,500 a year, which would be Indonesia or Egypt. Uh, not for its own sake, but because it signifies key enabling features, such as a middle class internet fluency, and above all, a more or less robust civil society. There are contradictions. Some oil-rich societies can be bought off. The wealthy Libya's transitional difficulties indicate, as I said, zero prior experience with personal empowerment, civil society. Our study shows that over time, nonviolence is usually a more effective approach. Uh, regimes with guns can always out-violence uh, protesters. And critical is the role of armies. When they refuse to shoot protesters, Moscow in 91, Kiev, Tunisia, Cairo, uprisings usually succeed. When armies do shoot, as in Tiananmen or Rangoon, or through paramilitaries like the Revolutionary Guards in Iran, they're usually suppressed. And Syria right now is a challenging anomaly. The incredible braveness of those students uh, saying, sniper, sniper, here is my neck, here is my head. It's almost uh, unfathomable. Of course, after uprisings come the hard part, transitions. It's a fact that uprising leaders generally don't do the transition part very well. It makes capacity building vital before and after. Patience is required. Democracy is behavioral. It's complex. It takes decades to build capacity. Reinforcement of our knowledge is important that each trajectory is different. Our role, listening more, asserting less, it's not about us. Democracy can't be exported. We're not norm givers to norm takers as we thought we were in Russia in the 90s. And it's not about markets as it was then there. Though there are obvious cross benefits between inclusive economic institutions and inclusive political institutions. Above all, the rule for democracies is do no harm. Don't take sides. The negative reaction to outside aid to political parties in recent years, to advocacy groups, has uh, encouraged donors to shift much more from that to capacity building support. But the big lesson is that you can do two things at once. Uh, as the ambassador, the U.S. ambassador to Michael McFaul, formerly of Stanford, told me in February that dual track is the rule now. You can have a strategic partnership and you can support human rights defense. On the ground, what works? You know, elections free and fair are only one of several starting points. It's a precondition, but too often in the 90s, we treated it as the goal itself. Managing inclusive pluralism, post-election, rooted in law, much more than sectarian conflict, uh, though reconciling democracy and religion is vital to the countries that we're going to be talking about. Transition to inclusive pluralism needs a strong central state as a guarantor. I mean, Somalia is pluralist but it's completely anarchic. Again, civil society is the building block. Uh, and, and, and generally, it's consistent with higher incomes, uh, acts, um, presence of a middle class, and access to communications technologies. But uh, our research shows that, uh, though we make much of the social networks, actually people make revolutions, uh, not technologies. There's a need for consensus. There's a need for a buy-in to the democracy project from the most powerful in society. The whole notion of pacting of old and new orders that we'll be discussing in coalition building. The authoritarian coalition, and this isn't the West against the rest, but uh, there is an authoritarian uh, coalition who thought that their lure of irresistible charm of authoritarian growth was making great progress because of their promise of economic development and security, prosperity, though rarely inclusive, uh, without loss of political control. 
But it's increasingly clear, and I, I think particularly of China, that they're only really able to deliver on what is called hardware, which is technical education, health, which is important, physical infrastructure, but not on vital software, leadership, fairness, attention to youth, innovation, a society that asks questions and makes connections. But their uh, attention to counter technology is fierce, uh, and their mentoring of each other continues. Uh, though uh, increasingly, I think, people are seeing that their regimes are possibly sacrificing uh, the next stage of development. Just to close, a few policy trends. Uh, the responsibility to protect is not about democracy, uh, but it is about uh, observing uh, or recognizing that in some cases the principle of protection uh, wins over the traditional pr principles of non-intervention. Um, however, there, are, there is dissent about this, including from very major democracies for largely historic reasons. I think of India, Brazil, South Africa. They're skeptical about the misuse of the responsibility to protect. The Russians today uh, feel very duped by uh, the process uh, that occurred in Libya. Uh, and I make this point because despite that, the notion of uh, universal justice is nonetheless changing behavior. Uh, the notion, uh, the existence of, a, of, a, of an international criminal court based on universal justice is, uh, is changing behavior. Uh, the absence of the United States from that court, of course, is a, is a, a deep deception to many. But I do believe that's one of the things that has influenced the change in behavior in Burma. The State Department in Washington has uh, changed behavior. Uh, it's it called for uh, much more uh, outreach to non-state actors, to civil society, uh, dual tracks. The extent to which, of course, this is going to survive the Libyan tragedy has to be seen. The biggest lesson for democracies is that of consistency. Uh, consistency uh, so that uh, behavior toward one country is not manifestly uh, so distinct from behavior uh, to other countries. Um, that uh, strategic partnerships and dem democracy development support uh, can be sustained at the same time. Uh, another lesson is that donor democracies have to accompany democracy projects for the long haul of concrete support for transitioning democracies to help them to deliver. Because if they don't deliver in economic security and governance terms, they're not going to survive. Ultimately, I guess, where uh, governments of uh, democratic countries are moving toward is uh, with respect to aid, it's more for more. More aid uh, for more democracy and less for less. But there needs to be a clear, absolute clarity on the rules and on expectations. That's my report to you, and I pass it now to Steve. Thank you. Is this on? Okay. Thank you so much, Jeremy. That was a, a terrific introduction. Um, Jeremy is a statesman, and I'm just a rank-and-file political scientist. So I'm going to step back and look at some of the same issues that he did um, from a very on-the-ground and realistic perspective and treat these issues from a more theoretical perspective. And as a scholar, step back and ask, what have we learned as scholars that maybe we can share with non-scholars over the last 30 years or so? You know, intense study of democracy, of democratization, of new democracies has been going on for about three decades now. And I think it's time to step back and actually take stock of what we've actually learned. Um, one thing we've learned is that socioeconomic development does seem to matter. Seymour Martin Lipset, in a classic piece written in 1960, said that there is a very tight correlation between how rich a country is and its chances of being a democracy. And for the most part, that generalization continues to hold. 
That continues to hold. It seems like the passage of time has confirmed that big hypothesis. Now, we know much more than we did in, when Lipset wrote his article, his classic piece about the causal links, about why, in fact, richer countries tend to be better at sustaining democracy um, than poor countries. We also know that there are many exceptions, many outliers. There are many poor democracies in the world, um, probably a score of countries whose per capita incomes are in the low thousands of dollars are full-fledged democracies. There are some richer countries, including Russia, which are not democracies, Belarus, Singapore. Um, so there are, many, there are many exceptions, but for the most part, there is a correlation. Um, but as the eminent Cornell political scientist Valerie Bunce has noted, that's pretty much where general agreement ends. Kind of, we know that, that this generalization that was uttered by Lipset 50 years ago probably holds water. But after that, we're still arguing over about what actually causes democracy and autocracy. Um, but there's some factors now that, that factor fairly largely into our assessments that I'd like to, like to discuss. And I think they're very relevant to our discussions, particularly the regions we're going to be covering tomorrow. Um, first of all, let's start off, start off with oil. There's a big debate over whether oil is a bane uh, to democracy or not. Um, I think on the whole, though, something resembling a scholarly consensus is developing that oil is, in fact, bad for democracy. It's bad in many different ways. And again, this is not a subtle issue. But for the most part, hydrocarbons dependence, economic dependence on hydrocarbons tends to disfavor democracy. And there are many reasons for this. Um, on the one hand, oil creates a what's oftentimes called a rentier effect. Jeremy alluded to this in his comments, where oil states are able, if oil revenues per capita are high enough, to actually buy off the population. If you're a Kuwaiti citizen, it might be harder to get excited about self-government if the government is cutting you a check for the price of a down payment on an apartment in Kuwait City when you turn 21 years old. So goes the argument that people can be anesthetized by policies that involve high social service provision and very little taxation, okay, a so-called rentier effect. There's also a repression effect. Some states uh, that in the absence of enormous oil rents could not afford a sophisticated, massive repressive apparatus are in fact able to afford it. We see this very starkly in a country like Iran and are able to repress what elements of the population cannot be bought off. So that repression effect is there as well. There's also what sometimes economists and political scientists call a truncated modernization effect. Um, modernization, we know, is consistent with democracy, consistent with what I just said about Lipset and his hypothesis. On the other hand, modernization happens differently in countries that are oil rich than in other countries. So for example, Saudi Arabia has a per capita income that puts it on a kind of southern European level, and yet something, on the, something like a quarter of all Saudi women are still illiterate. So I mean, you get a different kind of modernization where it's actually fueled by oil. And there are other effects as well. There's a kind of um, external attention effect. Countries that have a lot of hydrocarbons tend to get a lot of external attention a lot of it not benign, um, a lot of it very self-interested and, and sometimes malign. And this actually can have a bad effect on democratization as well. There's a corruption effect. Um, there's just so much to steal in oil states that elites tend to be, um, there's, there's more to steal, so corruption tends to, that tends to fuel corruption. When uh, elites who perhaps at the onset of democracy were in favor of open politics, become rich through um, nefarious means, their interest in open politics tends to wane. I've watched this happen in Russia. And ordinary folks tend to begin to associate democracy with kleptocracy, with massive theft. This is not good for democratization either. So there are many ways in which oil can actually um, undermine the prospects for democracy. Now, I think this factor is going to lurk and should lurk in our discussions tomorrow when we talk about the Middle East and about, um, about the post-communist region. The post-communist region has several super petro states. Russia, predominantly, but also Kazakhstan, Azerbaijan, Turkmenistan, and many countries in the post-communist region, of course, are oil importers, similarly in the Middle East. Um, Iraq, Iran, 
Algeria, Libya. These are major oil producers and oil exporters, but many other countries in the Middle East, including Tunisia and Morocco, are not petrostates. Um, what difference is this going to actually make? Is robust democracy in Russia really impossible? Just for structural reasons, just because it is a petrostate, two thirds or three quarters of whose export income comes from oil and natural gas. Does that render democracy in Russia virtually impossible? Does Tunisia's paucity of hydrocarbons give it a perhaps hidden advantage in democracy? Does Tunisia's neighbor Libya face much longer odds in its efforts to democratize by virtue of the fact that it's an oil-based economy? Or will Libya show that oil and robust democratization can go together? And you know, this is a question in other regions as well. Let's take, let's take a couple of countries outside of the regions we're going to be looking at specifically in this conference and consider them. Um, there's, a there's a terrific natural experiment developing now for those who are interested in democratization in Africa and in Inner Asia. Two of the great stars of third wave democratization, that is democratization that began in the mid-1970s and that continues to the present day, are, um, are Ghana and Mongolia. Ghana is really the shining star of West African democracy in many ways. It underwent successful democratization two decades ago, and Ghana remains now a vigorous multi-party democracy. Mongolia in Inner Asia, among all post-communist countries, is the one that's really maintained open politics. Um, what's interesting is, 20 years ago, when these countries underwent democratization, they were net oil importers. They didn't have much oil. They didn't have much of anything the world really cared about in terms of raw materials. Now they struck oil. Now, the question is, can oil actually mix with democracy in these countries. Will Mongolia and Ghana be like Norway? Will they show that if you've had democracy for a couple of decades before you strike hydrocarbons, before you get the oil and natural gas, you can maintain your democracy despite the hydrocarbons? Or like Russia, will they show that robust democratization and oil do not mix? What about religion and religious tradition? When we talk about culture and its influence on, on uh, the prospects for open politics, we very often end up talking about religion. We tend to forget in highly secular societies that religion is culture for most people in the world, whether they're believers or not, or, or not, religion is certainly a very important determinant of culture. Um, we know among predominantly Muslim countries that there is a general trend that would show us that predominantly Muslim countries tend to lag on democratization. This is just an empirical fact right now. If we look at the post-communist world, um, most predominantly Muslim countries have failed in democratization, all countries in Central Asia, Azerbaijan. There's some good news in Albania. Albania has done relatively well in democracy, um, doesn't get much attention. That is a predominantly Muslim country. But for the most part, um, within the post-communist world, predominantly Muslim societies don't do all that well. But does the Arab experience and the, does the Arab Spring and particularly the Tunisian experience now blow apart our notions of the relationship between Islam and democracy? This notion that um, uh, Muslims and particularly Arabs are uniquely immune to democracy's charms was very popular until about 18 months ago. All right. Then some stuff happened in Tunisia that showed that, wait a minute, um, maybe these folks care about their freedom as well. And it was very interesting to note, many social scientists and many pundits, many journalists um, have been saying for years that, you know, Muslims actually, they care about good things that the rest of us care about. But you see, it's not freedom they care about, it's justice, right? It's justice. But what's interesting is these people in Tahrir Square, the folks who made the revolution in Tunisia, the folks who are making the revolution in Libya, are holding up signs and telling journalists, we want freedom. We can tell this is really not just about bread prices. Of course, underlying trends in world food prices, of course, the big political economy issues are of some importance. But what people are calling for is their political freedom, their political rights. That's what they're excited about right now. It's not just about a better standard of living. It's not just about a better distribution of income. It's about freedom. The notion that Arabs are somehow uniquely immune to the charms of political freedom has, in fact, been blown up 
out of the water by the Arab Spring, particularly by the Tunisian experience. We also know that predominantly Muslim countries can be democracies and can undergo robust, sustained democratization. Indonesia shows that. The question now is, I think for us, and this is where the Arab Spring is so important, is in probabilistic terms, are countries that are predominantly Muslim in their populations still less prone than non-Muslim societies to undertake robust democratization? We don't, we don't know. I mean, this is an open question right now. That it, the fate of the democratic experiments in the likes of Tunisia and Libya and Egypt is actually going to radically shift our perceptions on that question, whatever they are right now. And this, of course, is something we'll be talking about as we go on in this conference. Finally, let me say a word or two about, about institutions. Um, Institutions are by definition the work of human hands rather than structural background factors. And I think there's a consensus developing among social scientists who study democracy over the last couple of decades in particular that institutions really do matter, that constitutions matter, that where power is vested in government agencies really matters. Let me pick one area where I think institutions are particularly important, and that is the power of the national legislature. I have found in some recent statistical work with Catherine Michael, who is a co-author of mine on this piece, um, that the probability of a country actually succeeding in undergoing democratization depends vitally on the power of the national legislature. And in fact, the predicted probability, we ran some numbers, on Tunisia escaping from autocracy, that is escaping from that not free category that Freedom House has created to describe countries that score at the very bottom of its Freedom, of its freedom House score range, the probability of Tunisia becoming a democracy of, of but avoiding autocracy in the future doubles if one just introduces a simple yes or no variable. Will the president have decree power or not? If the answer is no, if the legislature will monopolize the right to make laws, if the executive will not enjoy decree power, the, prob the predicted probability in our equation of Tunisia actually escaping from that not free category goes from about 30% to about 65%. Okay, this is based on some models we've run um, looking at the whole world. Institutions matter. Where power is vested matters. One of the reasons why a powerful legislature is so important is that the great enemy of uh, free government over the last couple of decades in the world is not um, an overly strong insurgent civil society. It is not men in epaulets as much as military coup can still provide a, um, it still can provide something of a threat. It is not uh, separatist movements. It is executives oftentimes elected presidents, it is monarchs, it is overweening executive power, and the thing about legislatures is they can check overweening executives. Is Tunisia off to a particularly felicitous start in part because it has taken decisions early on in its transition that look to be creating a system that is going to vest most political power at the national level in parliament and create a largely figurehead presidency? I would argue the answer is yes. If Libya, in fact, can follow Tunisia's path and establish a strong legislature and a relatively weak and constrained president, will that help Libya overcome the potentially baneful effects of its hydrocarbons dependence? It might. It might. What about Egypt? Egypt seems on track now to be creating a relatively strong executive presidency that may actually hold decree powers. Now, no matter how open and democratic these elections were, and they were open and democratic in Egypt, they weren't perfect, but the elections for the presidency and for the parliament were Little monkey business aside, for the most part, open. And the guys who actually got the most votes won. This isn't Russia. That actually the votes were counted and everybody got to campaign, everybody got to run. Egypt actually underwent real democratization in these elections. But will the existence of a strong executive president who might enjoy decree power greatly undermine the prospects for democratization in Egypt? I would, I would argue that the answer is yes, but 
the Egyptian story is just starting to be written right now. If the new Egyptian constitution vests exclusive authority to make laws in the parliament and denies the president the right to make law by decree, that, in the view of, of myself and many others who study this question, would be a terrific blow in favor of the eventual prospects for democratization in Egypt. So institutions, political economy, issues like oil, um, levels of economic development, all these things are going to be in play as we discuss uh, the cases we're going to be looking at tomorrow, both Tunisia and Russia, the, the larger Middle East and North Africa, and the post-communist region, and of course as we go on today and talk about democracy, education, and, and other issues, I think these issues will probably uh, be in the background of our discussions as well. So thanks for your attention and thank you so much for coming. Welcome. In keeping with the theme of this conference of having both scholars and practitioners, it's my pleasure to be moderating this panel. The panel consists of uh, four speakers, and uh, we have an hour and 30 minutes. And also, for, since this is a university and this is Berkeley, time for conversation and discussion. And so I'm going to request each speaker to speak for by my math, that gives us an hour and 30 minutes. And if there are four speakers, everybody speaks for about 15 minutes. And I will try and hold flashcards, et cetera, et cetera, <laughs> reminding people that time is up. Uh, the, the panel is democracy, engagement, and civic participation. And what I will do is I'll introduce each speaker serially rather than introduce them all collectively. So I'll start with the first speaker, say a few words about them, and then let the speaker take over rather than introduce the whole panel. Uh, First, Mr. Robert Lagama, who is uh, the president for a Council for Community of Democracies, right? Sounds suspiciously like CCC, no, no, okay. And uh, who is also, has, it, has had a distinguished career in the US Information Agency and received the highest prize given by the US Information Agency for Public Service, the Murrow Prize, if I recall correctly. So, Mr. Lagama, floor is yours, and you'll be speaking to us. Thank you so much. Uh, I am overjoyed to be here in Berkeley, even though I had to wake up at 3 o'clock in the morning. Uh, I first came to this campus in 1962 when I was starting college myself at the City College of New York and hung out with students here and wished I had been coming here instead of going back to New York. So this is always the sweetest word in the academic world to me has always been Berkeley. <laughs> so here I am. And uh, it, uh, it's also uh, uh, somewhat synonymous to me with democracy. I think there's so many uh, good things that happen in this place that uh, uh, democracy has a good ho a home here. Uh, I want to talk about what I call democracy education, uh, the essential and often missing ingredient uh, in democratic transitions, in democratic consolidations, and in established democracies like our own, uh, which we, uh, where we take uh, democratic values much too much for granted and don't do enough to uh, uh, perpetuate them by uh, inculcating them in one way or another. Uh, I represent a small non-governmental organization in Washington, D.C. that was born in, uh, at, the, at, at the conclusion of the Warsaw Conference of June 2000, where Madeleine Albright, for the first time in history, called together more than 100 foreign ministers uh, to talk about their common commitment to democracy. And at that conference, they drafted something signed by 106 countries uh, called the Warsaw Declaration, which I think is an update of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and calls, uh, uh, underlines uh, the uh, uh, imperative of, of all people all over the world uh, having a right to a democratic form of government, ultimately. Uh, we, what we do, is we provide a civil society component to the community of democracies, which otherwise consists of governments. Uh, governments working together on, do, uh, on democratic values. Uh, we do that by organizing 
a network of 27 of us around the world uh, uh, who work for democracy promotion organizations. Some of them are human rights people uh, in, uh, in places like Russia or Singapore. Uh, others are heads of uh, uh, institutions like the Westminster Foundation or the uh, European Inst uh, Foundation for Democracy or the Institute for Democracy in South Africa. Uh, 27 of us and we try to provide uh, the uh, uh, grassroots support for the concept of democracies working together. One of our most successful projects uh, the crown, the, uh, the jewel in our crown uh, was Jeremy Kinsman's own uh, Diplomats Handbook Endeavor, which we think is having an impact on uh, changing the nature of contemporary diplomacy, uh, having it catch up with events around the world that have led to democratization, increasing democratization, and putting diplomats from democratic countries on the side of democratic development. Uh, another project that we've just launched yesterday uh, is headed by Admiral Dennis Blair, former uh, Director of National Intelligence of the United States. And uh, Dennis is, has done a, a handbook uh, called The Armed Forces in Democratic Transition, where he um, has, is about to publish uh, a series of case studies taking uh, as his model Jeremy Kinsman's uh, project on diplomacy, uh, where we look at transitions to democracy uh, in places where the military once ruled, like Chile and Indonesia and Philippines and, uh, and uh, another a dozen places around the world. Uh, and we try to do what Jeremy did, and that is provide uh, some guidance to policymakers, and diplomats and, our, and military officers on what they can do uh, to support democratic ideas among their counterparts and in civil society. Uh, let me just begin by saying at the conclusion of the 1972 film that was set here in California, uh, the candidate for Senate, uh, played by Robert Redford, who wins an election, then utters the famous words, uh, and what do we do next? Okay. Uh, it seems that that question was also posed in very dramatic fashion after the fall of the, world, of the wall in Berlin, uh, the end of apartheid, and the ouster of dictators uh, following the Arab awakening, and uh, many other political transformations that have continued in, uh, in what Huntington called the third wave of democratization. Um, in monarchies, the answer is easy, and it's expressed in the expression, the king is dead, long live the king. No problem with transition there. Uh, but in most cases, uh, the end of an old order leads to a vacuum. And the vacuum needs to be filled, and the dream of democracy has to take some form. And a constitution uh, has to be articulated to enshrine the aspirations of people, uh, to form a government that affords them the opportunity to live a better life. Uh, when the dust settles, institutions must be shaped to provide rule of law and representative government. Out of the ashes emerge, if, we, if it's done right, a free press, political parties, social, uh, civil society, uh, and if, uh, if democracy is to stand the chance. And then there are those elections and how to conduct them and how to assure their fairness. Uh, what is needed then is a whole new set of rules. Uh, Jeremy pointed out that democracy is learned behavior. And people who have lived under an autocracy for all of their lives and all of the generations preceding them don't have those democratic habits. And they have to be learned. And sometimes that is very difficult. Uh, I, I want to make uh, really three points, and that is uh, this is important, folks. Uh, this is essential. Uh, 
an informed citizenry, uh, without, without an informed citizenry, there can be no democracy. Uh, without a conscious effort at, to inform uh, citizens about not only how to vote, but how to participate in the democratic process, uh, there is no democracy. Uh, you may have one successful initial election, and then the next time around, hardly anybody goes to vote, or the, 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 the numbers drop off precipitously, and there is very little else uh, that goes along with that in terms of political participation. So when that dictator falls and new constitution is in place, uh, and I've seen that happen in a number of places, including South Africa, which was my last diplomatic assignment uh, at the time of Mandela, uh, then begins a process of compromise, a national negotiation, uh, which is, in turn is, is predicated on a tolerance for the views and interests of others, and a pact agreed upon by all parties, every one of which has to be prepared to make some sacrifices, to compromise, to tolerate views of others, to consider other alternatives. Uh, under the dictatorship, absent were political parties, free expression, free press, right of assembly, free speech, uh, uh, representative government, rule of law. So the, and, and the, the main options were either obedience to the regime, or resistance, and very little in between. Uh, democracy requires a whole new perspective, new habits, and they're sometimes very difficult to instill and come by. Uh, one point I would like to make is that the exercise of those rights uh, has to be very carefully learned, uh, and it's what we call education for democracy. And while ideally the entire population of a society in transition has to be immersed, should be immersed in a month long seminar. You know, let, let's bring them here to Berkeley and let's teach them how to develop these new habits. Um, the nature of a transitional process makes that very difficult. Uh, democracy education is a crash course in most cases. Uh, and it, it, it's done in a most adverse kind of circumstances with lots of distractions. And it's a traumatic experience, I think, for most people to have to go through that kind of change. Uh, exhilarating sometimes, but also traumatic. Um, such was the case for South Africa, which you'll be hearing about from our friend Ed O'Brien, my neighbor here. and. Uh, The problem we face in a country like ours is, is, is apathy and, and uh, complacency and uh, the, the failure of cultivating these democratic values. Uh, democracy needs to be understood by the people that are affected by it and the people whose lives it changes and the people who really are the essence of it. And what I want to talk a minute about is the role of, a, of citizen participation during the transitional period, which is really critical in many countries around the world right now. Uh, there's a heavy concentration often on the first founding election, and we get those long lines in places like South Africa where 80 or 90 percent of the people are voting and they're excited. Uh, and. Uh, they are after what the word that has been used in the Arab awakening more than anything else is a quest for dignity, human dignity. Not so much freedom and not so much liberty and not so much democracy, but the end of the humiliation that is imposed by an autocratic regime that makes decisions for people rather than allows them to make them themselves. Okay. Uh, I recall the fever pitch of uh, political involvement in South Africa during the transition when apart apartheid ended. But then when the Mandela ANC government attempted to get citizens in the townships to end their boycott and pay their electric bills under the democratic regime, 
they found that old habits died hard. People just didn't want to pay for electricity. They were used to tapping into the, the, the public lines and not paying for it. Uh, and that was true of a lot of other behavior. Uh, I, I recall when I was in college, uh, one of the great heroes of the African independence movement, Kwame Nkrumah, used to recite very often, give me first the political kingdom and all else will follow. And uh, it turns out that it wasn't that simple. Uh, When the campaign promises of political parties during elections fail to deliver a better life, voters are frequently disillusioned with the newfound democracy, with the newfound freedom. Uh, they're, they're asking questions like, where are the jobs? Uh, where are the schools for our kids? Uh, where, where's the housing that were promised? Uh, the expectations are always built up to a fever pitch during campaigns, and the delivery is never up to the promises. So the disillusionment sets in. This is especially true, we found, in Latin America, uh, where we've had such a tremendous transformation from uh, guys running countries with uniforms to democracies, and yet the tremendous disappointment, the lack of development of strong political parties, and the failure to deliver the promises. It's hard to persuade a people that have suffered repression and struggled and sacrifices that the hard part is yet to come. We saw that in South Africa. After all of those years of struggle, after all the suffering that occurred in South Africa, uh, to, to, to have that government come to power and then to realize that the hard part was yet to come. They had to build a new a uh, political system, a new social system, uh, a new economy, uh, something, a task that takes a generation or more. And they're not there yet. Yeah. Well, that, that's why we think that democracy uh, and civil society requires a heavy investment in, uh, in, in encouraging citizen participation at every level. And uh, starting with the schools, uh, in the long term, it's the schools that will make the difference and, and will develop a commitment to democracy, but not the way we did it when I was in school, <laughs> not the civics courses that I took. Uh, this has to be done with passion and imagination. Uh, it has to be not done as a separate subject, but it has to be integrated into history, into geography, into social studies. Uh, it has to be done uh, with an eye to involvement in the community and not just sitting around listening in the classroom. It cannot be done uh, by memorizing the names of the counties in Michigan, as my friend uh, recounted to me he, he, he had imposed on him when he studied civics in high school. Uh, let, me, uh, let me just give a couple of examples of how I think uh, uh, this uh, uh, works in a couple of places. In Taiwan, uh, the tr teacher training college in, um, in Taipei uh, did an experiment in high schools. Uh, they involved students in environmental projects. Uh, they had them study uh, for example, the elimination of a wetlands and the replacement of that wetlands near their school with a housing project. And they had them recommend to the city authorities whether this was a good idea or not. Uh, that was one of many projects of that kind. Uh, this is a good example, I think, of what kinds of things can be done. Uh, in South Africa, at the end of apartheid, uh, it, it, it was a laboratory for the world. You know. How are they going to do this? Uh, when we gained our independence uh, and had to write a constitution, we looked around for models. And where did the founding fathers of the United States look? They looked to ancient Greece and Rome, because there weren't too many models of democracy around in those days. Uh, the South Africans looked to Australia, they looked to Canada, they looked to the United States, they looked to Eastern Europe, they looked to Western Europe. They had lots of models. They actually sent 
exploratory delegations around the world to, to look at how best to do broadcasting. You know, should we do it like the BBC or the Americans or, or they decided the Australian model was best for them. And they adapted that. They didn't just buy it whole hog. Uh, they, they designed all of their institutions with their own needs in mind. And uh, that was uh, interesting. Uh, I did a conference for African uh, educators in South Africa after the transition. And uh, we brought together a group of civil society people to say, help us do this. And uh, they said, we don't want these guys to sit in a classroom. People came from 25 African countries, and instead of talking at them, we took them to Soweto, we showed them what civil society organizations were doing, we took them to the Constitutional Court and talked about how that was structured, uh, we, we took them to see street theater uh, in the townships, uh, and uh, uh, they came away with a sense that uh, you know, there was something very important happening here that it was, there was a dynamic situation that was engaging the entire society, and we hope they took some of those lessons back home and used them. And I think uh, I'll, I'll, I'll try to wind up very quickly. Um, what we have done and which we distributed uh, here is we produced what we call a, very pretentiously, a global strategic plan. We brought together experts from about 20 countries and uh, we said, what is needed at the macro level, at the international, at the global level, uh, to get governments to take actions that will reinforce democracy in countries around the world, in their own countries and in other people's countries. And uh, we've set out this global strategic plan, and it has been adopted by the community of democracies as its a program. The government of Mongolia, the chair of the Community of Democracies, has made it its priority. Ban Ki-moon, the other day, has said this is going to be the theme of International Democracy Day on Monday. It will be celebrated on Monday. Actually, it's Saturday, but it will be marked on Monday. Uh, I will be going there for a ceremony that will involve uh, all of the UN missions. Uh, and we're hoping to generate some support for Mongolia's plan to hold a conference of policymakers in New Delhi uh, in January uh, that will lead to concrete reforms in a number of countries. We recently got a grant from the United Nations Democracy Fund to run a project that will start off with some pilot programs in places like Ghana or Nepal or Tunisia. Uh, we're still working on that. And we were, were preparing uh, a manual of best practices from around the world of what countries are doing effectively to advance democracy education in their countries. So we're trying to operate at this policy level. Uh, and basically, we're, doing, we're asking countries to do what Samuel Gompers asked industry to do. Uh, what do you people really want? We want more. We want more resources, we want a higher priority given to this subject, and we want to see action taken in the next couple of years to reflect the fact that this is the glue that holds democracies together, especially in new and fragile democracies, but even in our country. Thank you. Sorry, I can't see. Our next speaker is Ms. Red O'Brien, founder of Street Law which I think is amazing work, bringing law to the non-lawyer. And he's done path-breaking work in South Africa. And it's a real pleasure to have him here, because I'd like to have some legal knowledge as well. You never know when it comes in handy. So Mr. Mr. O'Brien, thank you. OK. Uh, I'll give you a little bit of background of, of who I am. I started off as a high school social studies teacher in Baltimore, Maryland. And I'd had one year of law school when I started teaching, so I used law in my classes. And the, all of a sudden, there was a lot of interest. What happens if I was stopped by the police? What, what happens in this situation? And all of a sudden, they weren't just falling asleep like they were in my other social studies classes. They were actually getting quite lively. Uh, so I went back to Georgetown Law School and finished up. And in finishing up, I sat in a class where a professor said, would anybody, sorry, would anybody like to get involved in a program where law students would go out and teach in the high schools? And I said, 
Well, I, I did this as a high school teacher. Why not? I'll do it as a law student as well. And I sort of raised my hand and I kept that hand up for the next 40 years because we created an organization called Street Law Inc. We, we uh, took this around the United States. We took it to about 40 different countries. And the concept has become, I'm happy to say, kind of accepted around the world as meaning law in your everyday life on the street, law you need to learn, democracy education. And over the years, we expanded it from just, democ just law to democracy and human rights, because you really need all three. I've written some articles on this that all three uh, go together. The essence of the program is two things. One, it's practical and relevant to everyday life. And two, it's highly participatory and interactive. So I'm going to ask you, if you don't mind, to wake up a little bit after lunch and do a very short exercise with me. Everybody will need to stand up. And the, all the people on the end here need to have a pen or find a pen. This is called the pencil game. Everybody has to hold up a pen. If everybody would just stand up, the entire, the entire group. Because your teams. You're a team if you're across. You can, you can be seated too. You don't have to be standing to be a team, but as long as you're in a line. So we have about probably about 10 or 11 teams. Now over on the end is a person with a pen. Hold the pen up, everybody on the end of every row. Very good. We're doing very well so far. <laughs> now I want you to start the game. Why aren't you doing something? Pen away. <laughs> that would be one possibility, put the pen away. All right, you need, you need to know something more, I guess, to play the game. All right, pass the pen into the right, right hand of the person next to you, all the way across, and then back. Okay, go. No, hold on, wait a minute, wait a minute. You, you gotta push it to your left hand when it gets across the middle. It switches to the left hand when you get across the middle. So pass it back to where we started. Uh, you're, you're just, you're just not doing the game right. You're just not, yeah, we're just not doing the game right. Okay, start, start the game again, going across. Okay, this, this group didn't get it back. All right, well, we'll this, this group here, this is the third, team three, wins because they have more men in their team than any other team. So they're the winners of that particular game. Now, now does it? Now, now, Jeremy, you don't know this, but Jeremy is my cousin. And that's another reason why he won that game. <laughs> And then, now does anyone have a dollar? Yeah. Anyone want to give me a dollar? Jeremy, give me, he's my cousin, he's going to give me a dollar. Not $20. <laughs> well, that'll be all right. Just... If I give you a dollar, will it be? I got five. All right, well, you'll get it back, I promise, I promise. <laughs> Thank you, Jeremy. That's another reason his team won the game. Maybe. <laughs> all right, you can sit down now. Thank you very much. <laughs> So this, this, um, this game has been played in probably 50 different countries, as well as all across the United States. It's a, it's a game that's part of the street law program. I, t I teach now a law and ethics course at the University of District of Columbia, combining street law with some ethics materials. And they do this game too, and they, they love it just as much. So it, it, but what does it illustrate? What, who, who can tell me what it illustrates? <laughs> Fairness. Somebody said corruption. <laughs> corruption, procedural fairness. What is, what is fair, in a game or in society or in government? What is fair? What else does it does it illustrate? What did I do? As, as you, lack of communication. Communication must be good for society to run well. So the communication is key. The rules can't change. I'm sorry, sir? I don't know if you follow orders. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's a dictatorship, for one thing. I'm the dictator. Nobody got any input into this game or any decision making at all. This was definitely illustrates a, a dictatorship and what could happen uh, in a dictatorship. I also changed the rules in the middle of the game. 
that's something you shouldn't do. And we, have, we actually have a phrase in law called ex post facto laws, as many of you know, I'm sure, where you, where you pass a law and, and then have it apply to something that's already taken place. So they, these are illustrations that illustrate concepts that we can do through a very simple game that takes more than, no more than five or, five or 10 minutes. Now, in 1980, we had been doing street law across the United States, and that meant we got law schools to send law students out at 70 law schools in the United States, including Berkeley, uh, including the University of San Francisco, which has been the center of the street law program out here. And this whole concept of law students going out and teaching has been very popular. But it's not the only way to do it. In fact, you must do it with teachers. If you're going to have democracy education the way Bob uh, says that you, you, you must have it, you need to do it with teachers. You need to have teacher training. You can have law students come in and help them, lawyers come in and help them, human rights people can help them, whoever can come in and help, but you need to have teachers trained. But the law school model is a good one. When we took it to South Africa in 1985, I was brought over by Bob's old organization, the U.S. Information Agency, and I toured South Africa for about a month. I did workshops all around South Africa, and there was great reception, and in particular, down in Durban, South Africa, David McCoy Mason, who was the dean of the law school in those days, some of you may have met David. David is one of the biggest proponents of democracy education. Is the biggest, I would say, in the world. He's been, I think, to over 100 countries now, actually, uh, helping them set up programs. And he's retired as dean, so he can do that. And he, he, he does it very well. So I met up with him, and he took the American Street Law book, we have a high school textbook, and he changed it for South Africa. He produced five pamphlets that were that corresponded to five chapters in the American Street Law book. And the American Street Law book is all activities like this pencil game, not all activities, but many activities like this pension game. Lots of case studies, lots of role plays, mock trials are a key thing. We created the mock trial competition in Washington, D.C., and that spread all around the country and also to a number of other countries as well. But when I went to South Africa, I, we ran into some problems. There were some challenges in South Africa. And one of the challenges is illustrated by a meeting that David McCoy Mason had with a principal of a Zulu, black Zulu high school in, uh, in what was then called Zululand, is now called KwaZulu Natal. And he told the principal about this idea of teaching law to his students and teaching them their rights. And this principal looked at him and said, why do you teach our children to jump up and bite us in the throat? <laughs> So yeah, that kind of problem with some people weren't quite open to it, but others were, fortunately. I had a problem like that in South Africa, too. I went to, to meet uh, to a meeting in a men's club in St. Elizabeth, uh, Port Elizabeth, right? Port Elizabeth and on the coast in South Africa. And meeting me was a man I was told was the brother of the Minister of Law. Well, this is around 1987. There had just been uh, an emergency orders issued by the Minister of Law to arrest many, many people and to stop demonstrations, et cetera. So I was meeting his brother, and my, my role was supposed to be to sell him on the street law program. So I was a bit nervous about what was going to happen when I met this opera conner. Uh, who's, the name was Vlock, if any of you know South Africa. The minister was named Vlock. So I, I, I told Mr. Vlock what street law was all about, and he kept listening very intently. And then he looked at me and he said, I like this street law. We will teach them to obey the law. <laughs> that wasn't exactly what we had in mind, but I, I left quickly because I didn't want to just disavow him of that idea, whatever. Uh, Bob mentioned this idea of what do you do after the election. And in South Africa, a group of people came together and said, we need to have a training program for people in what is democracy besides elections. And so they created, we were a team, our Street Law Inc. people and the South Africa people, including David McCoy and Mason, created a book called Democracy for All. And this, I think, is about as good as I've seen of a book to simplify democracy and have a lot of interesting exercises uh, in it. Uh, basically, to tell you what's in it, the chapters are what is democracy, how government works in a democracy, checking the abuse of power, human rights in democracy, elections, 
citizen participation, perhaps one of the most important things. In our programs, we not only have students participate in class, like a pencil game or some other role play or activity, we also have them go out in the community, go out and see what's really going on in their society, get them to volunteer, community service, advocacy programs where young people get together and try to bring about change in their community. This is a big part of the citizens' participation part of this book and of, uh, and of our programs. The last thing I want to mention really is uh, some work we've done in Mongolia. Mongolia has been mentioned already as sort of a model for a country uh, moving towards democracy. And we found the same thing when we went there to teach. They were so open to the idea. They took the Democracy for All book and they put all different examples in there that were Mongolian-based examples, and they translated it into Mongolian, and they published it, and it's still being used uh, in the uh, schools today uh, in Mongolia. Some of you may have gotten a handout called the Snow Leopard. Did people get a white page handout called the Snow Leopard? It may not have gotten to everybody, and we have copies we can give people later, but this is from the Mongolian curriculum that they produced. And just to give you an example of what they do in Mongolia to try to make it relevant to Mongolian kids, is they have this example that kind of goes like this, a case study. We use a lot of case studies. Mungum is a herdsman that lives in Kurd I Amig, I can't pronounce that. Mungan's family has many cows, goats, and sheep. One night, Mungan hears noise from the dog and animals outside. He takes his gun and goes out from the gear. Outside, he sees dead animals and a leopard, which is still eating his sheep. Mungan shoots the leopard. Later, the police visit Mungan and tell him that he must pay a fine for killing the snow leopard, which is an endangered species. He does not pay, as he says he has the right to protect his property. Mungan must go to court to settle this dispute. So what do we teach through this? We have a discussion of, of these, these two competing values, endangered species and property rights, and which should really uh, overturn the other, which should be more important. The role of courts comes in here. Oh, we got copies are coming out, good. The, the, role, the role of courts in making these decisions and helping the society, hopefully, in a helpful way, they're not corrupt, of course, they, they uh, balance the different interests and decide what's most important at this stage of, of the society and what to do in regard to it. So the, the uh, students were very interested in this, and this is just an example of how you take the broader concepts of law and justice, human rights, uh, environmental issues, and build them into local problems. Because we don't believe you just take a curriculum. We didn't take the American Street Law book and say, go teach this American Street Law book in, in um, Albania, and in Russia, China, all these, we've been many of these countries. We said, here's an American Street Law book. Some of this may be useful to you, some may not. The techniques are useful, though. It's all about the methods. Obviously, you need content, important, relevant content, practical content. But what you really need are interactive methods. You really need these sort of case studies and debates, mock trials and role plays. Small group work is very important to get kids all talking, because when you get everybody in a small group, everybody participates. In a big, big group, you don't get everybody to participate. So we did in the pencil game get everybody to participate, if you notice. So you can do it through things like that. So thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Our next speaker is Mr. Gary Sraga, who is, has taught for the political science department, has worked as a consultant for Native American tribes, other NGOs, and most importantly, I guess, has been a chief strategist for the Democrats in California for was for many, many years. And so he's going to tell us how you educate the citizenry to uh, take part in elections or vote the no, right way? No, just to vote for us. Just to vote for us. <laughs> no, if you don't vote for us, we don't encourage you to vote, trust me. <laughs> in fact, dirty little secret some of you may know is that part of any good campaign, certainly the Obama campaign, is to depress the vote. Seriously. Yeah. I mean, uh, if you want to talk, this is not, this is off subject, I realize, but look, you got to, yeah. How many of you were around in 1986 and, and when Alan Cranston beat Ed Shaw? Are there people in this room who remember that? Okay, so I ran Alan Cranston's campaign. 
when you have a, uh, uh, this is a little aside, so when you have an unpopular incumbent, which is what the president is running for re-election, he starts off the election with all the votes he's going to get. If you notice, the polls don't move very much because most voters have decided they either want the president re-elected or they don't want the president re-elected. So the battle you will discover if you just follow this over the next two months is only to a very limited extent over persuading undecided voters to vote for your candidate as opposed to the opponent because there aren't that many undecided voters. A lot of the what goes on in these campaigns will be an effort to discourage turnout by, by the opposition. Uh, uh, Obama's biggest concern is, is that his base come out and Romney's got the same problem, but that's an aside. It'll be a great day when most countries in the world have to deal with that dynamic. Australia, yes. But, you know, if you don't have elections, you don't worry about that. You just kill the opponent, um, which we don't do here, generally speaking. Uh, so as you heard, look, I've, I've run five campaigns for statewide office in California, three for governor, two for U.S. Senate. I ran the California legislative Democrats campaigns in the assembly for a bunch of years. I've run school bond campaigns. Um, but nonetheless, I am somewhat normal. I'm a lawyer. Uh, I'm the managing partner of the Los Angeles office of one of the largest firms in the world. We have uh, 1,400 lawyers. I know that's a scary thought. Uh, in uh, 43 countries and 60 offices, we have uh, uh, offices in a lot of the Middle East and Africa. Uh, so I live with some of these issues just about every day. Uh, I taught uh, undergraduate political science. I've taught undergraduate political science as an adjunct fourth. I'm in my 13th year. And the first, I teach one course a semester. My first four semester, four years, eight semesters, were right here at the University of California at Berkeley, where every Thursday at 2 o'clock, interestingly enough, I had to be on campus. Remember, I live in Los Angeles. <clears throat> and the school does not reimburse for transportation. But for the last nine years, I've taught at USC. And I will be barreling out of here as soon as this panel's over, because my class is at 7 o'clock tonight at USC. <laughs> So, uh, you know, I thought, well, um, uh, I've, Alan and I have known each other for a long time, and Jeremy and Alan and I bonded over Indian food at, in, in Vancouver back in March after a conference. And I thought, well, what could I bring to the table here that other people aren't going to bring, other than maybe a lot of cynicism? Uh, I have had very little experience with regime change, although I will tell you that by quirk of fate, I happened to be in Tiananmen Square the day before and the day after martial law was declared. Uh, having been invited by the People's Republic to speak on American politics to Chinese college students, and they forgot to cancel the trip. Uh, so my wife and I literally got there and marched down Chang'an Avenue from the, the, the jailing, the Beijing Toronto, and we were in the middle of Tiananmen Square twice, day before, day after. Day after, there were helicopter gunships overhead. I thought they wouldn't shoot me. I don't look Chinese. And, 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 and they didn't. That's a bizarre thought, but nonetheless, it worked. I'm still here. So in, in thinking about what I would want to share, some observations or some thoughts you're free to accept or reject, uh, what I tell my students when I teach this stuff is, look, everything we're talking about comes down to one five-letter word. This whole discussion comes down to one five-letter word. It starts with a P. It's power. Politics is about power. It, it's who gets to, to run things, who gets to rule things. You're either running things or you're out. That's it. It's that simple. And, and everything else is execution. I don't mean that literally. It, it, it's how you get stuff done, OK? We're talking about power. Who runs a country? Who runs a city? Who runs a state? And this is not a nice game. It's a tough game. I've played it for a lot of years. I personally am a very nice person. You'll have to stipulate that. But let me tell you, this is hard-knuckled stuff. It is playing for keeps. This isn't a joke. It's very serious, and the stakes are very high. And the players who play it play it that way. So if this is a discussion about power, the question is, how have we established in the United States of America a system that has managed, with one notable exception, for us to share power and to shift power peacefully. To me, that is the significance of the United States of America. We have lasted for a couple centuries, and with the exception of a stretch in the 1860s, where tens of thousands of Americans killed each other, let's just note that for the record, because there's a lot of mythology about what America is all about, we have managed to run this country peacefully for a couple of centuries. And, you know, I view this is, I know, kind of silly, but I thought, okay, what's democracy? Democracy is lamb stew. 
and, and there's only one ingredient that has to be in lamb stew if you're going to call it lamb stew, and that's lamb. Everything else can be local ingredients, local herbs, local spices, local vegetables. And, and so I wanted to, I was thinking, well, what, what's the lamb in lamb stew? And to me, the fundamental uh, ingredient in the American uh, political system, and I believe this very strongly, is that we have an ethos, we have a belief uh, that one person equals one vote. It used to be every man gets a vote. We're now gender neutral. One person, one vote. Every person in this country, according to that ethos, has the right to have an equal say in the formulation of public policy. Now, you can agree or disagree with that, but to me, that's the lamb and the lamb stew. That's the one thing you have to have if you're going to have a democracy, is a fundamental belief that every citizen of that society has an equal say in the formulation of public policy. Now, if that's true, let's note for the record that we've done a pretty bad job. Okay? We believe that. I love America. I think we have the best system in the world. But then you have to say, okay, how have we defined, you know, I'm going to be a lawyer for a second, what's the definition of a person? Well, a person who has a vote in America was originally what? A white male who owned property. You were not a person who had a vote if you were female until 1920. You were not a person who had a vote in this country if you were under 21 until 1972, and then we lowered the voting age to 18. And for about 100 years, notwithstanding what the Constitution said and what the law said, you really were not a person who had a vote if you were African American. So I think it's important, if we're going to talk about democratization of the world, and I certainly think that's that, that we've heard that's the trend. Occasionally, it's two steps forward and one step back. And certainly, it's our goal. And I think we want that to be what the world becomes. I think we need to realize that what, uh, what democracy is all about is that everybody gets theoretically an equal say in the formulation of policy. And in order to do that, you have to have certain mechanisms. You have to have a constitution that embodies the broad objectives and the vision of what that society is. The Equal Protection Clause of the 14th uh, Amendment of the United States Constitution, if you look at the jurisprudence, is one of the most important, whatever it is, 12 words in this country. The Equal Protection Clause has been the basis for opening up the political process. You have to have a constitution. You have to have an independent judiciary that can overturn stupid decisions by other branches. You have to have separation of powers. There are certain very basic things that you have to have if you're going to have something that we would label a democracy. But fundamentally, democracy only works from the ground up. It only works if the people who are the, uh, the intended participants in the process believe in the democracy, believe in that ethos believe that, that, that you can balance, and this is again the beauty of the American system, you can balance the rights of the majority and the rights of the minority. Should the minority tyrannize the majority? No, but we have it going on right now in Washington, D.C. with the House of Representatives. You know, I mean, the majority has certain rights, can't trounce the minority, but on the other hand, the minority is not expected to be able to hold the majority hostage. There's a balance between public interests and private interests. And that's a very careful balance that we've established uh, in this country. What is the role of an elected representative? I mean, there, you know, there have been, been a lot of treatises written about whether your job as an elected official in a, in a democracy is to do what you think is right or what your voters, the people who elected you, expect you to do. There are an enormous number of tensions that I'm trying to whip through here in about 15 minutes that underlie what we call American democracy and, and, and underlie what we think we're selling to the rest of the world. And those, to me, are the lamb. Those are the core concepts. And how those are, are flavored in, in, in other countries, I think you know we, we have no control over, shouldn't expect to have control over. And it's important that, that the people in those countries be able to, to, to flavor that. Um, I also want to say, I think, that um, we need to not be too self-congratulatory. Uh, because uh, again, I run campaigns in the real world in this country. Uh, I have sat through more focus groups than any of you would wish. Because when you sit through focus groups, as some of you know, uh, you consume large quantities of M&Ms uh, <laughs> behind the one-way mirror. And I'm a type 2 diabetic, so that's not good. Uh, but I have literally sat through hundreds of focus groups. And I have conducted a lot of polls. And I've um, given a lot of speeches in other countries and on, on American democracy. And I've, I've done all that stuff. And, and look. Right now in the United States, two-thirds of the electorate think that the country's headed in the wrong direction. 
That is a very important number for everybody to recognize. That number has existed for quite a while. It's existed probably since about uh, 11 years ago yesterday or, or two days ago since 9-11. Uh, Americans are unhappy. Uh, there is a very strong sense uh, in America that the political system is broken. Uh, and one of the fundamental tenets of this country is competition. We believe competition is very important in the economic marketplace. Uh, it is a great tenet of the country, whether you're a Democrat or Republican, you think that competition is good. But I would submit to you that our political system in this country has been in the hands of a duopoly for many, many years, that there are absolute barriers to entry into the political marketplace, that there are no new voices in the political dialogue. Uh, as some people who asked me to come here today know, I spent from um, September of last year till January of this year very quietly traveling the country, uh, racked up a hell of a lot of miles on United because it was my job to talk to people who might want to run for president of the United States on the American Select ballot. For those of you who know what American Select is, uh, it's an organization that was funded uh, significantly by a guy named Peter Ackerman, who's associated with the Fletcher School of Tufts and has spent a lot of time and effort on regime change. Uh, to introduce a third voice into the political dialogue because there is a, a, a real thirst on the part of voters in America for more choices. Now, you can come back at me on that if you want, but I am quite convinced from the research I've done, Americans are very dissatisfied with the choices that are being served up by the Democrats and the Republicans. If you know anybody who's enthused about the Obama uh, Romney race, please let me know. I'd like to give him a call. Um, and I will tell you that I talked to people you've read about and you know by name in the paper. I signed a confidentiality agreement and I can't tell you who they are. But they're senators, former senators, governors, former governors, mayors, corporate executives, and labor leaders. The only name that leaked out was, was Mike Bloomberg. But all the other names remain secret. And I will tell you, and I would, I would testify to this under oath, that every one of those people, every one of those potential presidents of the United States said to me in a meeting where it was just me and that person, or maybe there were three or four of us in the room, that the American political system is broken. They all believe that. Most of them did not believe that Americans elect was a viable solution. And it turned out Americans elect at the end of the day did not get on the ballot for a whole set of reasons. That's a separate discussion. Uh, and they also, none of them were, were courageous enough to, to uh, take on their, their party, uh, which I don't consider a flaw, that's reality. So I think when we talk about, about selling American democracy uh, to the rest of the world, uh, one of the things we have to be thinking about is we still have some work to do here in the United States. The process right now is, is, is not in great shape. I don't think we're about to collapse. I don't think there's going to be a revolution. You know, if it, was, if it was China, we might have a cultural revolution and send everybody in Washington out into the fields, but we don't do that. Um, and, and, and I think we need to not be too self-congratulatory. On the other hand, there is the lamb and the lamb stew, and if we identify the important elements that make America what it is and have made our system work for most of these 200 plus years, then I think we have something to offer the rest of the world. So thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Pradeep. Uh, good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. I'm indeed honored to be in this great university with all you lovely people I've been hearing about. Uh, as uh, Pradeep mentioned, uh, we have a very large uh, voter base. 780 million is the uh, number for the next general election, uh, which is more than uh, all 50 countries of Europe put together all 46 of North and South America put together, 55 of Africa put together, an entire Commonwealth. Um, but uh, we have been uh, conducting these elections very successfully for 62 years, uh, ever since we started using the electronic voting machines. By lunchtime, the nation knows the results. And not once have we the, the, uh, delayed the election by a day, not once uh, the legitimacy of uh, the government has been questioned. People have lost by one vote, and still uh, they have accepted the verdict with folded hands. Nobody questioned. So the credibility has been established because of uh, the strength of uh, the Institution of Election Commission, which uh, the framers of the Constitution very widely made fiercely independent. 
the, the, it's a three-member commission now. It used to be a single member with so much of power. But probably the Indian Election Commission is the most powerful commission in the world because once we announce the elections, almost virtually the entire government comes under us. We can transfer the chief secretary, the, the police chief, or anybody. Uh, government cannot take any decision um, because this will may amount to uh, seducing the voters and using unfair uh, incumbency advantage. So with the, uh, uh, for, for all this, we have just a, a three-member commission from 1993. Uh, talking of the size, we used uh, about 1.2 uh, electronic voting machines. 11 million people are uh, uh, seconded to the commission to conduct the election. Mm -hmm. uh, that's for the last election. This time it will be a little more. Each one of them has a very specific role. Zero tolerance is what we allow them, which means they have to be trained so to give us a mistake-free election anywhere. Because any mistake in the, in the, in the election will lead to the public uh, the hue and cry. The legitimacy where will be questioned. It may lead to uh, ordering of the repoll, and we cannot afford to do that. India is probably one of the most diverse countries in the world. All the major religions of the world uh, we have. We have 6,000 castes. We have 18 official languages. We, uh, and uh, 6,000 uh, dialects besides uh, many thousand uh, local variation. And uh, since it's a, a land of diversities and minorities, every community is a minority somewhere or the other, linguistic minority, ethnic, cultural, and um, uh, everybody's interest has to be protected. Everybody must have fair faith in the system. There are uh, uh, adequate laws um, uh, protecting the, the status of all minority. And there is prohibition on the use of religion, caste, community, creed, and language to the, woo the voters uh, because it will vitiate the fairness of the election. Religious places cannot be used. But for the, the really weaker section, of society, which whom we call scheduled castes and scheduled tribes, what was formerly known as untouchables, are not. Uh, there is a schedule in the constitution listing them. That's why they call scheduled castes and scheduled tribes. For them, there is a, the, there is a reservation uh, about 15% um, for scheduled castes and 7.5% for scheduled tribes, so that uh, they are adequately represented. There has been a demand that there should be the 30% reservation for women in parliament. But uh, that bill has been pending for a long time. There is a lot of opposition. But interestingly, at the local level election, the municipal election and the rural election, uh, the 33% uh, reservation was introduced 20 years ago. And the experiment was uh, very successful. And three years ago, two years ago, it, uh, in, uh, this has been increased to 50%. And women are participating. Initially, of course, women uh, were illiterate or uh, their, uh, their husbands were dominant. They were proxy, the, the, the heads of uh, the, the, those elected bodies, but uh, gradually women started coming to their own. The, we, the, our efforts are to ensure that every community uh, and every cultural sensitivity is looked after. For instance, there are uh, the many communities where women observe a veil, as you know, they wear a veil. Uh, for them, we have separate queues. We have separate polling stations in many places. We also have a women officer posted in every polling station. And even on the electoral roll, we introduce photographs on electoral rolls only f five, seven years ago. There, uh, uh, some women pr in Tamil Nadu protested that their f photo on the electoral roll can be misused because f photos can be morphed. It went up to the court, and we came up with a compromise formula that uh, the printed roll must have a photograph. It is, after all, it's a postage stamp size picture. But soft copy of the electoral roll will not carry a woman's photograph so that it cannot be misused. So we try to hand, uh, take care of every sensibility. For the disabled, every uh, polling station, uh, one million polling station, must have a ramp. Every single uh, electronic voting machine, EVM, has braille facility. Um, and companion is allowed for the infirm and the weak. For the illiterate, the, uh, we use uh, symbols along with the name of the candidate uh, so that uh, it's easy for them to identify. 
and uh, for the minorities, the electoral role uh, has to be besides the, the national language, uh, Hindi or English has to be in the local, the minority language also, or the ballot paper also uh, is a bilingual uh, to take care of the minorities. Then recently, to make it really inclusive, because that was the title of the overall work uh, seminar, the, we the, um, uh, came up with what is considered a very interesting innovation. We used to uh, receive a representation from transgenders, that their gender is not known whether they are male or female. When the voter, uh, the election man goes to enroll them and, uh, and uh, find it very confusing where to uh, list the person. So we introduced another gender, other gender, male, female, or other. Now, one million people are now known as O, uh, the gender O, and this has been uh, followed by the census people also. One million people got enfranchised by a very simple uh, measure that we took. Now, the the, the security, you know, these minorities, the weaker sections, the downtrodden, have to feel secure to be able to come and participate in the election. We, can, we are always innovating, we are always learning. We introduce a system of vulnerability mapping of every polling booth. Who are the criminals who are likely to intimidate the voters? Which are the upper castes which dominate and do not allow the voters to come out and vote? Because uh, in many cases, low turnout is the vested interest of uh, uh, the, the dominant parties because their voters will come out in any case. And if there is a law and order situation created, if there are bullets uh, flying around, people are scared. Women are the first victim of any violence. So they, they are scared to come out. So we have to ensure that there is peace, the law and order. So we started doing vulnerability mapping. Who are the criminals? What is their background? Who are the people who, who they're going to, who are likely to be threatened by them? And then we take a preventive action under various laws. And in the last general election, about 370,000 such people were identified. And uh, action was taken, uh, taken, including preventive arrests under the law. They can go on bail or bond for good behavior so that they do not misbehave. We also the, introduce a video trail of criminal candidates because uh, we have been demanding the government that uh, they should bring a law to debar uh, people with a criminal antecedent to be uh, to from contesting election. But till that happens, because there is a lot of resistance, uh, we uh, decided that such people will be trailed by a video camera 24 hours. Mm -hmm. They keep looking over their shoulder and when they realize that everything is being recorded, they behave, which is why we have been able to conduct very peaceful elections uh, uh, recently. We, uh, uh, then uh, we also uh, provide the central armed police force. We, every state uh, demand, every party in every state demand that we bring forces from outside because they don't trust the local police, they don't trust the local officials. So we have to bring observers from outside, central for police from outside. And, uh, some we also conduct election in many phases. In UP, for instance, uh, three months ago, we conducted election in seven phases. Same force is multiplied, you know, taken from uh, one phase to the other, and lo lots of measures that we have taken. But one of the challenges that we had was participation. I have a little bit of a communication background. In fact, my the PhD is in social marketing which incidentally is the first PhD in social marketing in the world <laughs> because it was not an academic subject. In fact, it was a technique of communication followed by USAID across the world. Richard Manoff of Washington DC was uh, my guru and uh, he wrote the first book on that social marketing. And just as you can sell soap, you should be able to sell an idea. Mm -hmm. So if following all the marketing uh, principles, you, you, you communicate, it works wonders. We, I was a believer in a strong communication, and sir, in your speech, uh, when you mentioned uh, without uh, informed choice, uh, in, without informed citizenry, there is no democracy. So that was my belief. Yeah, I first joined as election commissioner. It's a six-year term, and the senior most becomes the chief. So I was the chief election commissioner for two years. Very first week, I suggested that we should focus on voter education because uh, our turnout, average turnout, has been about 60% in parliament. But as you go lower down, uh, uh, participation increases. It was dismissed by the then chief at that time. Do it in your time. <laughs> 
Now it was quite hurtful. What is my, in any case, what is my time? I was an equal member, I had an equal vote, that was my time as well. Every action of the election commission, I was equally participant. But just as well, I got my time after four years. And the first thing I did was to set up a voter education division. We started, uh, uh, we uh, got professional agencies to conduct uh, and the knowledge, attitude, behavior, and practice survey uh, using social marketing uh, techniques. And on that basis, we wanted to know what is the reason for voter apathy. That's the word Ed also used. Why are uh, voters uh, indifferent to election process? Particularly, urban apathy is the issue. Only 25%, 30%, 35% people turn out and vote. And these are the guys who sit in their drawing rooms and uh, criticize the government. Uh -huh. They have no business to comment on the government in whose formation they have not participated. And not only they do not vote, it is almost a fashion statement not to vote. Oh, all politicians are thieves. We don't want to vote. I've never voted in my life. So we thought that instead of a fashion statement, this needs to be converted into a statement of shame and embarrassment. So we launched a campaign, very interesting campaign in Delhi, for instance, uh, called the Pappu campaign. Pappu is a very common pet name in India, very endearing, uh, of a very simple guy, and we uh, sometimes use contemptuously. So there was a, a film song, Hindi film song, Pappu cannot dance sala. Now Pappu is a smart guy in that film, in that song, who does everything, multi-talented uh, fellow, but he has only one flaw, he cannot dance. <laughs> so we created a parody on that, our Pappu can do everything including dance, his flaw is he doesn't vote. <laughs> so so we, on that we developed songs, and it was so effective that at the end of the poll in the election in Delhi, everybody who had not voted was hiding his face, because we did name and shaming uh, through that, and all those who had voted uh, for the first time, they were showing their finger that it has to be marked. Look, look, I'm not a pop I voted, I voted. It was, it was wonders for us. You know, learning from this kind of example, we did the loss of communication uh, program. We converted into a people's movement. We were accused of murdering the festival of democracy that it used to be by imposing a very tight rules and regulations. And, uh, but we, uh, of course, there is a tight control on the campaigning, campaigning thing, it has to be noise free, you can't uh, the deface the walls, you cannot put up posters, uh, you have to stop your loudspeaker at a particular time. But then we brought in festival through people's participation. In UP, for instance, because of our, um, uh, after we created this voter division, participation division, uh, 11 elections were conducted, 11 states, and every one of them recorded highest turnout in history. In the last election in UP three months ago, there was 30% increase in turnout of voters and 45% increase in turnout of women voters. In all these 11, uh, 11 states, women outvoted men. So which uh, also very, uh, was very significant thing because we used women, uh, local icons, singers, actors, as brand ambassadors, as icons. Their appeal, all the, the, the efforts that helped us to uh, help to achieve great participation. You know, there used to be a demand that there should be compulsory voting. Very top leaders of the country, whom I would not name, uh, who used to demand that there should be compulsory voting, and they used to quote Australia. Now, well, my answer was instantly that uh, well, compulsion and democracy don't go together. Your right to vote includes your right not to vote. And uh, I thought the uh, of, uh, other op alternative was voter education, persuading them, telling them, and facilitating them. And uh, it worked. Uh, beside, uh, and also, it's uh, in, in, important for, for us to understand the logic why we oppose uh, compulsory the voting, because if there is a law, and if you do not vote, you are violating the law, there has to be a punishment. And even if it is one cent uh, uh, fine imposed on you, you have to follow due process of law, which means court cases have to be filed against you. 
Now, 300 million people who had not voted in the last general election would mean there will be 300 million court cases uh, <laughs> added after every election. It's impossible to, uh, to follow. I asked my Australian counterpart how the compulsory voting in Australia is working. He said that uh, they are uh, really the, uh, tro very troubled by this, and in fact, they're having second thought just to recover $1 or $5 of fine. They have to incur $2,000 uh, of expenditure, and it's prolonged litigation, six months, one year, two years. So it is, uh, and after all that, the turnout is 90%. Here we have brought turnout to 80, 85, 90% through persuasion, through voter education. So I do strongly believe that voter power without participation, democracy cannot be successful. But let me also make it clear that uh, when we talk of participation, it's not just turnout on the day of vote, uh, voting. It's also they have to get enrolled. We found the youth, particularly in 18 to 20 age bracket, were not getting enrolled. So we came up with a very innovative uh, scheme. Um, uh, uh, I was addressing a conference like this in uh, Odisha. And somebody from the audience got up and said that 18 is an age to celebrate. It sounds like a good idea, a good statement. Let's think of celebrating. Within a week, we came up with what is probably the biggest youth empowerment program of the world. We decided that normally electoral rolls are published in April, May, June, November, and the qualifying date for new voters is 1st of January. We decided that if we start looking for them in advance, this was this happened in the end of September. We still had three months for 1st of January. So we started looking for 18-year-olds uh, who will be 18 on 1st of January. And we decided that in the whole country, 5th of January, across the country, we'll uh, issue the new electoral roll. And on 25th January, which is our Founders Day, we'll have 800,000 functions across the country at every booth level, where the, these new voters will be given their voter ID card. It was such a success. I declared it as National Voters Day. Uh, very innocently, the, although I have been a civil servant, I should have known that a national day can only be declared by the government. But uh, see, after joining the election commission, we feel so independent that we forget all about the, the rules of bureaucracy. I had uh, written a letter to the cabinet secretary mentioning that we are going to observe 25th January as National Voters Day, and will you ask all ministries and States to give us cooperation. Two months later, just a week before this uh, D Day, I receive an inquiry from the uh, cabinet secretary. Uh, two questions: one, whether it will be a national holiday, or two, whether, whether how much money will be involved. <laughs> Fortunately, our answers were very palatable. One, we don't need a holiday, and secondly, we don't need a single dollar. Why, how can we do 800,000 functions across the country without a single dollar? Because voter registration is a normal activity anyway. Instead of doing it sporadically, haphazardly, we were just doing it in a planned manner. And very happily, the cabinet declared it as a national day for all time. And the very first national voter day, 18 million people got their voter card in one function, 800,000 simultaneous function. So eight months ago, the second National Voter Day, it went up to 38 million. And the kind of participation, you know, for whether it is registration, whether it is for turnout, then also we do of the voter education for the ethical voting, that they should not take any bribe for voting. All these measures work so beautifully. In one district, 115 kilometer long human chain was formed. In one place, the entire stadium was uh, decorated with the flowers and colors in a the thing called Rangoli, which is a very festive uh, thing that we do. It became a, a people's participation, people's program, and all these efforts have uh, the, uh, shown us dividends, they have uh, the, the worked wonders for us, and have now been institutionalized. And uh, many, many countries who had participated in the uh, National Voter Day function, uh, 35 countries of the world, including the chief from the US, Election Commission. They came and many of them found these, some of these ideas to be very replicable. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Just a little, uh, just a little aside. Uh, elections in India are a national holiday, so the day there's an election, everything is closed. 
but so you know that helps turn out I guess except and the in, polls pardon except the polls yes and in local turnout is often over 80 percent by just by itself you don't need to do anything so with that floor is open questions comments for whomsoever yes sir well as an Australian citizen here yes <laughs> Uh, we're focused on transitions, and I love your program, and positives and inducements are much better than negative sanctions, and I, you know, engendering enthusiasm is a, a wonderful idea. But the time taken would be the matter of concern in my mind. Now, you, you pass legislation that there's a penalty, and the penalty is it's not just the money. The penalty is the hassle you go through as a voter to have to justify it and so on. So it's a real strong deterrent. So if you want to get a high voter turnout in a post-transition situation, or in a transition and then uh, uh, immediately following, it seems to me the legislation requiring voting and having a penalty for it is, will, will accomplish that much more quickly. Hmm. Yes, you know, we were very clear that the uh, compulsion is not going to uh, work. Uh, because uh, it will be impractical, we won't be able to enforce it. As it is, after 60 years of independence, we have only the, about um, um, 16 million uh, court cases pending. On uh, that, 300 million will be added by after every election by us. So we don't have the court, we don't uh, to enforce. But when the voter education is working so successfully, uh, as I said, highest ever turnout in is 80 percent, 84 percent. Then one can think of uh, the compulsory education in the context of a 30 percent or 40 percent turnout. Here we are already getting 80, 84, 90 percent. Then there is no need. I think we need to develop our efforts for voter education. Yes, please. Could you introduce yourself in your? Oh, all right. My name is Ruby Unger, and I have feedback. Yeah. Um, how much? I mean, how much of your government budget goes to your commission and to voter education and registration and voting? Well, uh, the $12 billion uh, uh, would be the cost of entire management of election, which probably the cheapest uh, anywhere. And uh, voter education, will, uh, it did not co cost us more than a couple of million rupees. Is that uh, what kind of percentage of your... It's a, small per, it's a small percentage of your budget, well, right? Well, uh, it must have been a one, one or two percent. One or oh, two percent. There has been instances in the southern state of Tamil Nadu where the state government actually sponsors color television for a number of uh, residents. And I have actually personally witnessed these color televisions being delivered to the house of citizens just before the elections. And uh, I wonder whether um, specific voter campaigns are actually utilized um, or uh, misused by governments that basically purchase elections using color televisions or bags of rice for the poor, um, they, more, you know, worse than what they used to. Uh, yeah. You know, the, 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 the law is that um, you can uh, make any of the promises to the voter through a manifesto. That is all illegal. But outside the manifesto, if you make any promise, or if you are seen giving even a, one dollar uh, to a voter, that is a bribe and we proceed again. Manifestos we have no quarrel with. Of course, it's a matter of public debate whether free television or very cheap food grain or a um, uh, washing machine or a bicycle uh, should be given uh, free. Um, uh, unfortunately, or for, uh, or fortunately, the law election commission has nothing to do with it. For that, there has to be a separate regulation. Personally, I find nothing wrong with the, the parties <coughs> making an announcement through their manifesto. At least the television with their promise reaches the people. You know, Rajiv Gandhi famously said that if you uh, give 100 rupees for a program, only 15 rupees uh, reach the people. At least in this case, the whole television was that reaching. The food grain is reaching there and the needs of the people are getting met. And if there is a competition, free laptop, free all that, people are benefiting, frankly. But uh, whether it's a, there is an ethical issue involved, some people say that the, um, the, uh, the political party also has to announce how they're going to fund the, these uh, the extravagant programs. Well, but I think there are more of uh, academic debate. But people who are receiving all these benefits, uh, well, other parties can also offer the same television. Let them offer a bigger television. Yes, 
Yes, thank you for this presentation. My name is Monsef Sheikh Ruhu. I am an elected person in the new parliament uh, constitutional assembly in Tunisia. And we are facing a very, very tough problem with the uh, election commission. The first commission was volunteers, independent. Uh, we are here after their work. But now there is a big debate how to ensure the independence of the next commission from the executive branch and from the uh, 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 parl parliament itself. Yeah. So what's the experience of India? It's very dear to us. Discussion is very hot in the parliament in Tunis now. In fact, uh, as I mentioned, uh, the independence of the commission and neutrality of the commission is of utmost importance. We have been successful because of our fierce autonomy. Of course, the, it is always a temptation of the government to encroach on our autonomy and to somehow force our hands to do things. But the Supreme Court has been our guardian angel. And any effort by the government to interfere with our work uh, the, is put down uh, very heavily there by the court. <coughs> I was invited by Egypt and uh, Jordan. And also we have been in touch uh, with Tunisia. They wanted uh, that uh, indelible ink for, for marking the finger. So I think uh, there is a lot of learning from our, our uh, Indian experience. Um, efforts of the government to browbeat uh, the election commission into uh, submission continue. It is for us to stand up fortunately. The constitution, the law, and the judiciary have stood uh, rock solid behind us. And uh, we have been able to lie. For instance, the dates of the elections are announced by us. Nobody else knows. The prime minister will be the last to know when the election will be held. So this is to take care of uh, uh, incumbency advantage. They may choose a timing of uh, which suits them. But we, we don't uh, allow such a thing. And the model code of conduct which we, the, we have, it's an interesting device. Uh, a voluntary code uh, created by political parties themselves. And the compliance to the code is much more than any law of the land. And even the uh, thought of a notice from us for violation will, will bring 5% uh, vote down uh, for those leaders. So they're very scared. If there is one institution uh, politicians are scared of in India, uh, it is the election commission. Uh, uh, I'm uh, uh, Michael Kao uh, from Taiwan. Uh, dealing with you know dem democracy development as well and earlier Taiwan was mentioned by <laughs> Bob but I think you know this panel uh, educate me really the the heart of the issue is really democracy education or civic education in the case of e India you know you have voter in the uh, education which really motivate people to uh, to vote and know the meaning of voting and democracy. Now, uh, I think, Mr. O'Brien, uh, you have this book, uh, Democracy for All. A and it's fascinating me, because uh, now, as uh, uh, Bob uh, Lagama mentioned, you know, uh, the community of democracy is launching a, a important effort for democracy education. A and, you know, it's a compl complicated topic, but you've got to have some basic essence for the education and how to communicate that, you know, essence, you know, to the voters, to the citizens, and so on, is very critical. Now, I just wonder, on the basis of your book, uh, Democracy for All, whether you have, you know, a sort of uh, uh, overall evaluation uh, of the effectiveness of the book involved and uh, how many countries really uh, translate and use. Uh, you mentioned Mongolia, I understand, but whether there are any countries who really uh, use uh, a sort of standard uh, textbook for democracy education. Mm -hmm. And I'd like to see if you can eliminate me more. Well, the, Thank you. A number of things there. You raised some interesting, uh, interesting questions. Uh, first of all, most textbooks on democracy and civics are very boring and don't teach well at all. Uh, again, I would emphasize what I did in, in, in my talk, and that was that only the use of interactive methods where students participate, they get involved in a hands-on kind of way, really work. And there's lots of research that shows that learning by doing is the best way to learn anything. 
Um, the, the, the evaluation of this particular book, not much has really been done, I'll be honest to say, evaluating, evaluating it. It's more anecdotal where people have said, teachers and others, this really works well with students. And we don't just take the book and translate it. Basically, it's, it's modified, just like I showed you the example of the Snow Leopard. They have put that into their Democracy for All book. They take some of the exercises work uh, just through translation, but most would be modified and adapted to meet the needs of that particular country. But we had to be very careful because we at times would work with people in other countries. There was, a, there was this... Uh, a law professor from Kazakhstan, as I recall, who got a hold of our book and said, well, we, I'm going to do this in Kazakhstan. And we got it back. People, it was in Russian. People said, this is just a Russian textbook. Your methods and all you do in the, in the American street law book and the Democracy for All book are not here at all. So it, it's, a, it's a delicate process to make a new, because it, it, it's changing education, it's changing the way people are taught. Thanks, Steve Hansen from the College of William and Mary. I have a question for Derry. Um, I was curious about your view. I mean, many people are skeptical of the third party solution because historically in the United States, typically that's simply led to the victory of the party that was ideologically further from where the third party began, right. from Woodrow Wilson to Clinton. And so people who are focused on the power dimension say, well, I don't want to get started with that because all I'll do is destroy you know, my chances to support the candidate I'm closest to, and it's quixotic anyway. Right. So I was surprised to hear you say that given your starting point, I was wondering um, how you would, you know, other people may argue the thing to do is simply try to change the parties since the system is what it is, or introduce proportional representation, you know, something that would change the, the, the incentive structure. So what's your view on that? Um, I believe fundamentally that um, American voters, and it's particularly true in California, perceive a monopoly or a duopoly and are trying to break it and are trying to send a message and have yet to succeed. And I'll give you, an exa I'll give you examples. In California, one of the many things I, I couldn't talk about because we don't have a lot of time here is that we have direct democracy. I mean, uh, the American democracy is fundamentally a representative democracy, but any Californian who has an idea can put something on the ballot and then the voters get to vote on it. And I think it's instructive that in California, we've had voter introduced, not legislative measures, uh, measures to have imposed very short term limits, which says, help me, save me from myself. I keep voting for incumbents and I don't want to. Uh, to uh, now we have an independent uh, citizens commission that draws the legislative district lines so that they're more competitive because the last for the last 10 years we've had essentially no competitive districts um, and now we have an, a primary that's a top two winner primary where in fact in the general election in California in November in 20 out of 120 legislative districts the two finalists serve the same party two Democrats or two Republicans so for starters, I would submit to you, voters get that this is, this is a monopoly and, and, and they are trying to, impro to impose what I would argue are antitrust measures on their own. To me, so that's proof of, of my thesis, right? Now, here, here's the practicality of this. Americans elect had a, essentially an infinite budget, it was a $30 million budget would have been on the ballot in all 50 states, but at the end of the day, for reasons that, you know, again, this is a, a lot of stuff to talk about in a short amount of time, Americans elect failed to get a sufficient number of delegates to come to its own site to meet its own rules to field a candidate. It was all internally imposed, and I argued that we should get a candidate on there anyway. Um, but let me give you an example when I say that there are, in economic terms, uh, very significant barriers to entry for, for competitors. In California, if you want to change the law and you want to do it yourself, you have to gather 500,000 valid signatures and then your measures on the ballot and people vote for it or not. If you want to change the constitution of the state of California, you need 800,000 valid signatures. If you want to simply form a third party to be on the ballot, you have to submit 1.6 million. Okay, so so the Republican and, and look, I'm the, I haven't suddenly become a disloyal Democrat. I'm I'm very much a Democrat, but uh, I'm concerned at this point in my life about the process, right? And and I would argue that the Democratic and Republican, and this is that's that's just one example. I mean, the the rules that you have to obey to get on the ballot in some states are truly bizarre. I mean, they're offensive. 
And, and, and I would argue that the Democratic and Republican parties agree on one thing, and that is the status quo. Now, the example that I use is the auto industry. Because if you're a baby boomer, your parents grew up all buying Ford or General Motors or Chrysler cars. And as the baby boomers, as we began to mature into car buyers, we really didn't like their choices. And we began to look at things like Datsuns and Fiats and, you know, we forget about Skodas and all kinds of other cars. The first Toyota was the Toyota Crown that was, went faster backwards and forwards. I think it was very ugly. And, and there were entrants into the marketplace that failed. But over time, the demand for something different than what we were offered by the American car companies over, won. In the end, the, the, the baby boomers broke through with probably the VW bug was the one that broke the market open. And so I, I, that may sound you know, silly to you, but I'm just waiting for the VW bug. Because, because voters have demonstrated over and over again they want more choices in America. In California, which is you know, kind of a cutting edge place, and we're proud of it, um, the, uh, the percentage of the electorate uh, composed of independents and third party registrants is about to be more than the number of Republicans. And so, I mean, I think that answer, I, I just think the trend is inevitable. Uh, Americans want choices, they're not being given choices. Ironically, we're in an industry, the, the political industry, if you look at the, at the recent history of America, we have deregulated everything. We've deregulated airlines, telephones, uh, bus companies, moving companies, uh, everything's been deregulated except one thing. The only undertaking in the United States of America that in the last 30 years has been significantly more regulated is, the re is running for office, right? And those regulatory schemes are, are not producing good results. And I think sooner or later, something's going to give. Thank you.